Hi, I'm Bob Cook. I'm going to be posing some questions to our special guest today, Doug Ball. Doug is our foremost historian, and we're lucky to have him with us to explain the history of our beloved deaf club called Charles Thompson Memorial Hall. To tell us how it came to be, but I'll let Doug do the explaining. Doug? Well, Charles Thompson Hall was established in 1916. Can we take a look at the photograph? I think we have one, if we could show them now. That picture was taken just after construction was completed in 1916. In fact, November 5th of 1916 was called a Red Letter Day. It was the opening day for Thompson Hall. That picture was taken shortly thereafter. People often ask where the name came from, who it was named after, just who was Charles Thompson. He was a very wealthy deaf man who almost never had to work a day in his life. He came from a wealthy family, the Thompsons. His father was the founder of the First National Bank of St. Paul. His name was Horace Thompson, and he and his brother founded the bank. They were also involved in the expansion of the railroads back in the 1850s and 1860s. Minneapolis St. Paul were both very small towns at that time and just starting to grow. Charles Thompson was born in 1861 during the Civil War. We're not sure how he became deaf, but he did attend the school for the deaf. Upon his graduation, his parents gave him the gift of a very large farm near Wyndham. It was a horse breeding farm. This was a key area for buying horses, racing horses. But Charles wasn't interested and decided to sell the farm and move back to Minneapolis. He preferred Minneapolis because it offered more interaction with other deaf people. Charles had been a, far, a bachelor for many years before he met his wife, Margaret. First, let's show a picture of Charles. Okay, and Charles met his wife, Margaret, if we could show her picture. His wife's name was Margaret Brooks. Margaret was born in Scotland, and then her family immigrated to Minnesota when she was a young girl. Later, she entered the school for the deaf, but didn't graduate. From there, because her parents decided to move to Colorado, she did graduate from the school for the deaf in Colorado. Charles Thompson met Margaret at an MADC convention in 1896. He fell madly in love with her, and they were soon married. They then hired Olaf Hansen, a famous deaf architect. Let's show his picture now. Olaf Hansen designed the house for Charles and Margaret. Charles hired him to design the house as a wedding present for Margaret. Olaf and Charles grew up together, attending the same school. Anyways, Charles and Margaret lived in their fancy house, often throwing parties which were attended by many deaf people. The house was in St. Paul near Dale Street in the Dayton Avenue area. The house is still there today, but it's been converted into six condominiums. It's a good, strong house, and it's still standing. Charles and Margaret moved to another house at about the same time as Charles' father passed away. This house was smaller and was designed by a hearing architect, not a deaf one. It was located in the Lincoln and Smith Avenue area. They continued to invite the deaf community to have parties at their new house where they played cards and held dances. The house had a large ballroom upstairs. Charles had a secretary whose family lived in the other half of their house, which was a duplex. 
Altogether, Charles had eight different secretaries, first of which was Julia Smith. Julie was a secretary and tutor, but moved away to work at the School for the Deaf as a teacher. Next was Anne Sonspear, then James Cohen, Mary Cohen's father, and the list goes on and on as he had one secretary after another. Charles had difficulties with English, so he always employed secretaries to assist with written English. Charles never had to work. He was able to do as he pleased, as he had always had a source of steady income from his father's wealth. Charles had a few homes, not only the one in St. Paul, but also two cabins that were right next to each other, located near Alexandria. Deaf people would gather there and set up tents near Charles' cabin. The people really looked up to Charles, almost as if he was the mayor of the deaf colony. He wasn't really interested in fishing, but loved to play croquet. He would play croquet late into the night with his father. Just before sunset, when his mother would let them know it was time to eat, he would tell her to wait, that they, would, that they wanted to finish their game. When it became too dark to see, he would order that lanterns be brought out into the yard so they could finish the game. The family had several homes throughout the country, including winter homes in Georgia and California. As Charles traveled throughout the United States, he always had, to go, had a home to go to. Charles passed away in 1915, leaving Margaret a wealthy woman. Since they had no children, Margaret couldn't decide what to do with her inheritance. Margaret was a very kind-hearted woman, and since the deaf community had been gathering at her home for many years, she decided to use the money to found the deaf club. She again hired Olaf Hansen, the deaf architect, to design the building. Olaf discussed the details with Margaret. The building you see today is basically the same as what Margaret had envisioned. It included an auditorium on the second floor and a bowling alley in the basement, which has now been converted into a bar. There was also a dining room on the main floor, and that's exactly how it looks today. Margaret decided to establish a board of trustees consisting of five members. The board was comprised of four hearing trustees from both the Thompson and Brooks families. There was also one deaf trustee. Today, the board is comprised of all deaf trustees. Anyways, this is Margaret's name sign, and this is Charles' name sign. So Margaret and Charles. Much of my information comes from Gordon Allen, who was a personal acquaintance of Margaret. Gordon never actually knew Charles Thompson. He served on the Board of Trustees for many years, doing a very good job of ensuring the Board followed through on Margaret's wishes. We have appreciated Gordon's involvement with the Board for so many years. Margaret passed away in 1929. She was buried alongside her husband in Oakwood Cemetery in St. Paul. Their graves are marked with an elaborate monument. The grave site is right next to former Governor Miriam. Charles and Governor Miriam were close friends and hunting partners. Charles loved hunting for many years. Really, the Thompson family history is very interesting, and I'm thankful to Margaret for all she did for the deaf community. The money that she donated was used as a building fund for the deaf club, as well as for funding the board of, direct, of trustees and investments. Because of her donation, we don't have to pay an entrance fee to get into the club. Thompson Hall is the only deaf club in the United States that doesn't require an entrance fee. So I'm very thankful that Margaret objected to that and set aside money to cover those costs. Of course, we still need money for Thompson Hall, and I would appreciate people's generosity in donating money. We need an elevator for the older people, like you and I, Bob, as we get tired of climbing the stairs. I would appreciate contributions that would help us install an elevator before we become too old, much older. There are a few other improvements and changes we would like to make to keep up with times and rising costs. 
So again, I would appreciate any donations. Since we don't have an entry fee, we need money for a few things. I guess that's about it. This historical information is really interesting. I very much have enjoyed having you share it with us on videotape so that we can share the story with other deaf people. Every time I meet someone, they ask me to explain the history again, so it will be nice to have it on videotape. I think I'll make extra copies to keep on file at Thompson Hall, so if someone from another country comes, they can watch it. Now, November 5th of this year will be the Deaf Club's 80th anniversary. Five years ago, we had a big 75th anniversary celebration, and time keeps marching on. I do see the building getting older. We need to keep up with the exterior painting. We need to add storm windows, air conditioning, a new roof. I think it's going to cost plenty to keep the building up. I also understand the building was just recently designated as an historical landmark. Can you tell us more about that? Yes, you're, you're right, Bob. That is correct. St. Paul has a historical landmark preservation commission, which operates under the direction of the mayor's office. Commission members are appointed by the mayor, and the commission oversees any building of historical significance in the St. Paul, greater St. Paul area. About two or three years ago, the commission decided to designate more buildings as historic landmarks and developed a list of 300 potential landmarks, one of which was Thompson Hall. Now, you know there are many buildings older than Thompson Hall, but to be eligible, a building only needs to be 50 years old or more. Thompson Hall meets that requirement. Many of the other potential landmarks are well over 100 years old, but in poor condition in comparison to Thompson Hall. After compiling their study, the commission's list was narrowed down to the top 10 for further discussion before a final selection was made. Sure enough, Thompson Hall was one of the top 10. This list was further researched and narrowed down to three. I was very pleased that Thompson Hall was selected as a local historic landmark by the Historic Preservation Commission. And this selection was also approved by the Minnesota Historical Society. In the future, I hope to see Thompson Hall added to the National Registry of Historic Landmarks. For your information, Three private homes in Faribault, Minnesota have been recognized as historic landmarks on the local, state, and national levels. So I hope Thompson Hall will be recognized nationally in the future, too. I hope so, too. Maybe it will be recognized nationally, even worldwide. We could show deaf clubs in other countries what a fine club we have, and we don't even have to charge an admission fee. What an impact that could have. Um, as a member of the Board of Trustees, I still have some concerns. We need to encourage our young people to recognize the significance of the deaf club and gain their support. I have noticed that many deaf organizations make use of the club, as well as some hearing organizations. I've also heard that two wedding ceremonies were held in Thompson Hall. Is that correct? Well, actually, I'm not sure how many weddings. More than two, though. I'd have to do some checking, but I suspect it's more like three or four. Uh, do you remember your classmate, or maybe it was a couple years before or after your class? Anyway, Janice Huberty was married there. They may have forgotten to count her. But anyway, anyway, there have been a few wedding ceremonies there, right? You're right. 
Regarding your concerns, yes, Thompson Hall seems small for the growing population of deaf people here in the Twin Cities as compared to the 1950s or 60s. The population today is much larger than when Olaf Hansen originally designed the building. He designed it for the population at that time. I know it seems cramped and that has caused some members to leave, but because of its location, it is really not possible to add on to the building. Of course, we want to show that we do treasure our history. When we look at Europe, there are so many buildings owned by deaf groups, schools, and clubs. They've been standing for 100 or 200 years. They value the historical significance of these buildings, and they take ownership over them. It'd be nice if the Minnesota deaf community took ownership of its deaf club. It means so much to us. I hope in the future young people will understand the significance of deaf clubs. We share your concerns about that. All right. Well, thank you so much for your time, Doug. I hope someday you will want to learn more about Charles Thompson Memorial Hall. If so, we have three videotapes that can be borrowed from our office at the Metro Regional Service Center. <laughs>